Okay, perfect. So I have been invited to talk about complications, consensus, and controversies. As you all know, for Cushing's, it's going to be more controversies rather than consensus per se. Uh, these are my disclosures, both as research funding, everything goes through the institution, and scientific consulting fee for the study design or steering committee. And this is a very timely presentation and the conclave itself was very close to Cushing's days. And I just wanted to remind you that was more than a hundred years ago. And did we make a lot of progress? Yes. Did we make enough progress? Clearly no. Look at first patient mini G. We still have many, many patients that still present as you've shown with beautiful cases earlier, very late in the course presentation and nobody even thought about Cushing's per se. And because of that, patients with Cushing's, as you have eluded in some cases, as presentations have already many comorbidities and clinical complications. Some are well known as neuropsychiatric disorders, atherosclerosis, liver steatosis and NASH that's uh, becoming more important lately for a lot of other diseases, osteoporosis and myopathy, and some others as cardiac disease and hypercoagulability that are trying to be more progressive and more aggressive in finding the disease itself and also in how to manage overall. And of course, you already talked about infection. I had several slides and I'm going to briefly go about it because you already did it very beautifully. So when we're talking about complications, because a lot of diseases have some complications, how we compare them as a magnitude for general population. So you see here in blue, is Cushing's disease and in red is general population. So if you're looking at the prevalence, overweight and obesity, it's relatively similar, but look at the hypertension here. Look at the impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes, major depression and osteoporosis. So we're talking about many, many times over compared with the general population. And because of that, we know that patients with persistent Cushing's disease have significant higher both morbidity and mortality compared with the patients in remission. And this data that I'm showing you was from 10 years ago. So we studied even older, and then I will show you later now. But if you're looking at the patients with persistent disease, the SMR for mortality was more than five. And with remission was a little bit better, but still not normal. So are we doing better now? We don't really know, and I will show you some recent data. And the problem with that is because there are several things that contribute to the morbidity and mortality. So patients could have severe osteoporotic fracture and that's increasing mortality per se, the opportunistic infection that you showed earlier, and a lot of cardiovascular complications, including hypercoagulability, and we have some new data on this, coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular events that sometimes can go unnoticed. So should we reverse? Yes. And how to do it? That's when it's becoming controversial because we go into a multidisciplinary effort that we should definitely work more with cardiologists on that. And the main reason why we didn't make a lot of progress, in my opinion, is related to the fact that the reversibility of complications depends on how long they are. So if a patient has like you showed for gross hormone, it's almost the same thing for Cushing's, it's even more. If they had Cushing's for 20 years, then the cardiomyopathy and a lot of the other complications, including on the bone, on the brain, you know, it's shrinking per se, is going to be much harder to uh, reverse or even uh, decrease if uh, compared with patients that are diagnosed very early. So we still have to move to an early diagnosis and prompt treatment immediately. So where are we now? This is a paper from a single center. I'm going to show you some multi-center also published this year uh, from Vienna. And they looked at factors associated with mortality in Cushing syndrome, but also they looked at complications and especially acute and life-threatening complications. So if you're looking, these are the patients with any complications versus these are non-survivors in gray and these are survivors in still gray, but the lighter gray. So the main issues that the patients had were, again, 
infection, that's almost like a light motif. If they were in ICU, hypokalemia and pulmonary embolism. So the rate of pulmonary embolism, as you can see, they're pretty high. And this is much more recent data. If we're talking about multi-center data, and usually I like the larger centers, single center, because it's a more unified approach, but this was overall, though with different uh, methods of treatment and from countries to countries, but this was a very large uh, European database of over 1500 patients. Most of them were pituitary dependent, some adrenal and few ectopic and other causes of Cushing's followed for almost three years. And they were, uh, mortality was 3%. And if you're looking very important, and I think that's where we should manage much quicker, 45% of deaths occurred within 90 days from start of treatment, and 10% of deaths occurred even before the treatment was given. So we have a lot of cases of severe Cushing's, and we need to uh, really look into more aggressive treatment initially. And as you heard earlier, the most common causes of death in that larger center were also infections, or progression of underlying tumor, because this included also the ectopic Cushing's. But infection, 37%, and this was this was study done in Europe, where overall the rates of infections in general populations are not very high. Very interestingly, uh, the older age of diagnosis of active disease predicted long-term mortality, but the male gender and longer duration of active Cushing syndrome that we think because they have sometimes more ectopic or uh, more duration overall did not have impact directly on mortality. Clearly it has on complications, but for mortality in this study was not shown. Furthermore, if we're talking about how long they persist about remission, this was a large uh, single uh, Swedish national patient registry over 500 patients, this was pure Cushing's disease. So forget about ectopic or other causes. And if you look in the blue stroke in red thromboembolism and in green sepsis, this is before the diagnosis. This is from diagnosis until one year after remission. And this is long-term remission. Look compare with one, all of them were still high. And this excludes, as I said earlier, patients with other causes of Cushing's besides Cushing's disease. So stroke is high, thromboembolism is high, and sepsis was also very high, even in long-term remission. Now, there is data from UK. This is a, a little bit older, but I just wanted, to, because that's the first time I'm mentioning diabetes and the last time almost for today, because we need a full talk just on the diabetes and Cushing's. But I wanted to show you that this is very beautifully shown by Clayton and all that patients that did not achieve remission with Cushing's disease clearly had higher mortality versus remission. But then if we're separating them by no diabetes and diabetes and no hypertension and hypertension, the curve separated significantly. So it's important one to be in remission, but also the type of complications and how well they are controlled, it's also very important. More recently though, we all knew that it takes a while for patients to um, go back to almost normal. This is a study uh, several uh, months ago in GCM about muscle function. So there are a lot of patients followed over long term with Cushing's in remission with easy chair rising tests, grip strengths, and all their other complications. And as you can see, so this is a chair rising test in seconds. So the higher you are, it takes you more to get out. Okay, so the chair muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. I don't know. I it in me. So uh, the influencing factors for myopathy were age and A1C, and as we can think, the waist to hip ratio was very important. So patients that were more obese, but specifically not just BMI itself, as waist to hip ratio had higher. Uh, delay in recovery 
on muscle function. And then there is some data that's pending on the role of growth hormone deficiency related particularly to that muscle uh, function. However, we have data from the HYPOX study. This was a long-term study on patients with growth hormone deficiency treated with growth hormone by one of the companies. And this particular study looked at comparison in patients with Cushing's and non-functioning adenoma treated with growth hormone. And briefly, if you look, this is metabolic syndrome, this is diabetes, cardiovascular disease overall. And in black is Cushing's disease and in gray is non-functioning adenoma. So if we're looking, these are all treated with growth hormone. If we're looking at three-year incidence, and it's pretty much the same with, with prevalence too, clearly, patients with Cushing's had more metabolic syndrome, more diabetes, and more cardiovascular disease compared with a non-functioning adenoma, despite the fact that they were treated with growth hormone. So previous Cushing's may predispose the growth hormone deficient patients to an increased risk of all these complications that are not reversible with growth hormone treatment, though this and could be a different discussion, we still have to treat some patients with growth hormone because otherwise complications could be even uh, higher. So let's briefly go through a case relatively similar to what you have presented and see what should we do for this patient. 55 year old female with four centimeter pituitary macroendonoma discovered during hospitalization for diverticulitis. She had two bouts of diverticulitis with sepsis, liver abscess, portal vein thrombosis treated with warfarin, hypokalemia, worsening diabetes, hypertension, central weight gain, and hyperlipidemia, weakness, non-displaced pelvic fracture. She was using a wheelchair and they did imaging in the outside hospital and they found a large pituitary tumor and this is why she was sent to us. So the labs on the left are our labs this was the tumor she, based on everything you've seen before. She was sent to us without a diagnosis of Cushing's. She was sent to us to evaluate for the large uh, cellar tumor with no mentioning of Cushing's. Though, as you have seen, there are probably 20 reasons why she should have been checked for Cushing's. So the labs were clearly consistent with very severe Cushing's as it was clear um, clinically. So. What should we do? This is a recent review that uh, we looked at all the literature on concomitant assessment for comorbidities that was published in uh, EG uh, last month. And I wanted to point out, and I will go separately by it. This is, we should probably for the patients I showed you do everything in the same time, cardiovascular assessment, thromboembolis prevention and infection prevention. And I'm going to enlarge and show them to you one by one. So cardiovascular assessment, I showed you that the cardiovascular disease is the main cause of death with infection. So we should initiate prevention and treatment as soon as we think about treatment for Cushing's. And sometimes depends where the patient goes. If they go to neurosurgery for a tumor like last patient I've seen, I shown you, sometimes the cardiovascular risks are pushed until after, but this is why the, one of the main reasons why the mortality could be increased. So let's go and look a little bit of some of these risks and what can we do about them. So the heart failure, it's very prevalent in Cushing's with left ventricular hypertrophy and atherosclerosis. You know that on, on the right, you can see the increased intima media thickness. The increased risk of myocardial infarction is very high and the increased risk of stroke is very high. So this patient will go to surgery with a very high risk of several deadly complications overall. How about hypertension? So what I wanted to point out, and sometimes uh, our fellows don't think about that, is that hypertension is very, very frequent in Cushing's, does not correlate very well with a degree of hypercortisolism. And furthermore, though we th say that it doesn't correlate with a degree of hypercortisolism, a lot of the effects are due to mineralocorticoid effects when the cortisol is very, very high. So we have to think when we're thinking about treatment that a lot of the, the hypertension is related through mineral corticoid uh, effects, including renin angiotensin system, sensitivity increase to beta receptor agonists and vasoconstriction overall. How about dyslipidemia? 
a diagnosis of Cushing's, we know that we have low HDL, high LDL, and high triglycerides. And it's seen in up to 50% of patients depending on population and with multifactorial causes. Importantly, if you look at the, uh, the studies looking at uh, disease remission after surgery, and we'll talk about medication separately, though they are pretty similar, the hypercortisolemia resolution has mild or no impact directly on lipids. So that's very important that we shouldn't wait for the Cushing's to get better. If there are abnormalities, uh, especially after surgery, we should treat specifically as we treat any uh, high-risk patient overall. And now let's move on to the hypercoagulability. This is a systematic meta-analysis that we published in 2019. So we looked at all the data uh, until I think early 2019, if I remember correctly, there was not a lot of data. So we should all get together and actually publish way more cases and studies because here we included everything that was uh, available and published. And there were 48 prospective, retrospective, cross-sectional case series uh, cohort or survey studies, the single study reports we excluded. And we found that 3.21% of Cushing syndrome experienced venous thromboembolism. Here, it was just venous. I'm going to show you some data with mixed. And the odds ratio was almost 18% compared with general population. The only good thing is, because when I was looking for some control in my mind, I was thinking patients, at least in US, patients that have hip fracture have to be anticoagulated. So where are we overall with the risk of hip fracture? So the odds ratio for perioperativity in Cushing's were a little bit lower than, um, but without, without anticoagulation versus hip fracture surgery. So at least we're doing better with something, but compared with normal population, still very high risk of uh, complications. When we look at our data, we looked at over 200 patients, 25% of these were, because this was over time, as you can see, lately we anticoagulated more. So some of them were anticoagulated. 18.2% had arterial and venous thromboembolism overall. Uh, there were a lot of events. So this is 0 0.60 days after surgery for most patients had some sort of surgery. We found no predictive factors, no sex, no BMI, no smoking that we thought it is, no high cortisol level or estrogen or testosterone therapy. Almost half of the patients though, underwent <laughs> the time of Somebody. Can you mute somebody? What are the causes for uh, embolic events? It's very, very complex, and I'm not going to go one by one. I want you to, you to have this in your mind because there are some things that maybe we can look at and decide if these are higher risk patients or not, that we have no clear data. And furthermore, I want you to, to point out that after surgery, even in patients with immediate remission that can increase the inflammatory response, the patients actually can have higher risk. So we have to think that patients with active Cushing syndrome have risks, the postoperative phase have even higher risk clearly, though we're trying to uh, mobilize them. But overall, anything that's with surgery, it's increasing the risk, even without Cushing's. And then in disease remission overall, there are some patients, as I've shown you in our data, that could have events much, much later. So this was a study in 2018, just showing you briefly uh, that you can have, these were endothelial damage uh, cells, VCAM, you can have even longer term, this is control, this is active, and then this is um, remission. You can have persistent inflammatory damage uh, that could be even years. Now, should we anticoagulate everybody for years? I don't think so, but we should really have high awareness that these events could happen. So overall, how I look in my mind uh, is, do we have any risk factors that we know of? And you see here on the left from 
if it's ectopic versus Cushing's disease, if they had a prior DVT and the risk factors that we know overall. And then non-pharmacologic methods in everybody. And then consider, and this is considered because it's the risk of bleeding and it depends with which surgeon were working, but at least consider starting pharmacologic prophylaxis after uncomplicated surgery and then continue for uh, for four to six weeks after surgery, if there is no increased bleeding risk. In high risk severe Cushing's, we should probably consider prophylaxis even prior to surgery. And then the, depending on what they are on to just make a bridge uh, throughout the, the few days before and immediately after surgery to decrease the risk of bleeding. So if you're asking me, and I can't see the chat, but if you're asking, should we anticoagulate everybody? Clearly not. Uh, because there are some patients that have higher bleeding risk. Do we have perfect uh, risk factors assessment? The answer is no, and the Cushing's consensus uh, is not published yet, but I can tell you from the meeting that it was not a full agreement. What would you use and for how long? I showed you that there are events up to three months, probably after bilateral anatomy. Uh, I'm extending from six weeks that I use now to even longer for all the others uh, should uh, probably be two to four weeks. And then there are some cases that showed DVT or other events after IPSS. Should we anticoagulate for IPSS? That's not our procedure right now, but might be something to think about. How about infection prevention? Uh, you went very nicely through the high risk and what are the mechanisms. So here I just wanted to uh, bring up that we should probably consider starting prophylaxis for everybody with very high urine. As it was shown, it's not a lot of data besides the Dr. Neiman study that was linked to UFC over 10. I think the duration of the disease plays a role too, because if you are immunosuppressed, you can be six over upper limit of normal, but then if you are for many years, you can be more immunosuppressed and if you have diabetes in the same time. Definitely, again, it's very important to consider the higher risk after curative surgery because the decreasing cortisol, it's actually increasing the risk of PCP. And then of course, address the risk factors for all the infection. Other things that probably we are aware, but it's not something that we can do too much about it, but it's very important for the patients, is the quality of life. So we know this was a study on generic questionnaires for patients with cured so-called, because that's definitely it's no cure for Cushing's, it's just remission. And if you look at several factors, both for NHP and for SF36, just look at the colors. Patients with cured Cushing's, it's in orange, healthy control in blue. If you look from physical functioning, social functioning, emotional, pain, general health, and health change overall, everywhere they were lower on the scale. And these were patients with so-called cure. So definitely we're not doing a good job in reversing the patient's quality of life or the complications for that matter, as I showed you, to normal. How about both? So we know more that Cushing's, it's causing osteoporosis we knew forever. Now what's more recent, and this is not just for Cushing's, it's for acromegaly and for other pituitary disease, is that evaluation of bone health should be done as a continuum and not just as a DEXA because the DEXA scan do not predict the fracture risk. So we need a morphometric analysis. And you've seen for prolactinomas, for acromegaly, we can see vertebral fractures on X-rays that are in patients with normal DEXA. And then it's a question of when should we use antiresorptive treatment with a biphosphonate? And it's possible in some cases that don't have contraindication that they might induce a more rapid improvement rather than cortisol normalization alone, though there's others that are saying, talking about controversies, that you have to wait at least two, three years uh, to see if the bone density does not become normal. So this is in general about complications and how to follow the patients. But are we achieving, and with some of the uh, updates on what happens after remission, thinking about surgery, how about medical treatment 
Because right now, at least in US, a lot of patients, and I will show you even in Europe, up to 30% of patients are treated with medications for Cushing's. And if some of them even uh, did not have surgery. So reversal of clinical feature is very important in addition to the biochemical normalization. And of course, ideally we will not have recurrences though, you know, in Cushing's disease, it's happened in up to 30% of patients if we follow them long enough. So when we think about treatment, I usually use surgery as first line, as I showed you earlier, and use medical therapy as an adjuvant treatment with minimal exceptions, unless the patient has complete contraindications. Uh, however, when we choose a medication, we should look at, of course, medical history, side effect profile, cost and availability, and the cost is becoming a huge issue, patient wishes, but also comorbidities. So what's the data on each drug, what's improving and what makes it worse? And especially in Europe, in US it's done less, the preoperative medical treatment is used to optimize severe comorbidities, like in the patient I showed you, diabetes, hypertension, hypokalemia prior to surgery. However, there is no data that it's improving outcome overall. It, you can delay the surgery and improve the diabetes and the hypertension, but it, even the Ercusin data did not show that you improve overall outcomes longer term. So if you can optimize very quickly, yes, if not, treatment of Cushing's should be done in the same time. And of course, it's confounding the assessment of early post-op remission. So when we look about drugs, and the talk is not about drugs in general, it's just about clinical effects, but I wanted you to think about, because if it's a large tumor, then yes, we might want to use drugs that work at the pituitary level, but we have to try and find out what we achieve with that. We have drugs that are working at the adrenal level, the adrenal esterogenesis inhibitor, and the only one approved in US is oscilodrostat, but we have all the others or in clinical trials or um, of label and glucocorticoid receptor blocker that in US it's approved for hyperglycemia associated with uh, Cushing's. So for pesirotide, we have sub-Q and LAR, and they work rapidly. However, it's controlling the, around 50% of mild Cushing's for severe cases, it's hit or miss, but it's improving the clinical signs and symptoms in a lot of patients and it's inducing tumor shrinkage. So for some patients that don't have diabetes, and I will show you why, this would be a good first line treatment to try and shrink the tumor and see how they do However, the uh, blood glucose level should be monitored very, very close because patients, if they have Cushing's, the likelihood of worsening hyperglycemia with pesirotide is over 60%. And we know now why, because the pesirotide inhibits both the secretion of insulin and the release of GLP-1 and GAP. So it's a more confounding factor. And also what's interesting, as you heard yesterday from Dr. Melmed, we're using pesirotide for acromegaly. For Cushing's, pesirotide is inducing even more hyperglycemia. The reason I brought up the uh, pesirotide data is to show you mostly that th this is the longer term data that we have. We looked at this paper for a while before we published it at every predictor possible. So what you have here are all the patients in the study that were treated long-term. And you see in blue, keep in mind that in the, most of the studies I'm showing you, the urinary free cortisol was the endpoint. So this was set up as normalization required by the FDA, but in general, this is still considered the gold standard. So if we're looking at patients that had controlled just the urine, this was 28%. If we look at a patient that had both, this is in blue, both UFC and salivary cortisol controlled, this was less. But if you're looking on the right on clinical improvement, look at how much is the difference on systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure and weight if we had both of them controlled. So this makes sense. There were no other predictive factors, not age, not sex and all that. We, we looked at, at all this. So the idea is maybe when we're using medical therapy and using just the urine as a marker, this is not enough and we should restore the HPA axis, the urinal variation if we can, 
or used in a different form to try to improve also the clinical features more. So Oscilodrostat uh, has been FDA and EMA approved last year. It's an oral inhibitor of 11 beta hydroxylase and also it's inhibiting aldosterone synthetase. And the paper for phase three was published uh, late last year. And overall, this is a very powerful medication. As you can see, this is week 12, week 24, and week 48 with in red complete response and in uh, green partial response. The over 66% of patients maintain normal UFC levels at least six months. And everybody, these were several means, almost everybody 96 had at least one urinary free cortisol normal, but then it went up or down. So that's uh, very interesting how, when you look at control, you realize that some patients sometimes will be too low. And this study had significant adrenal insufficiency and makes sense if you blo block too much, then you'll be insufficient. If not, you'll be get a little bit over high at some point. How about clinical improvement? Because this is the goal to look at today. So the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure, weight, waist circumference, glucose, and A1C improved. Furthermore, the mean percentage changes for Cushing's quality of life and uh, depression scores were also improved. So if we're looking at these, these were all significant and statistically significant. But when you look at clinical uh, overall outcome, we need more longer term data to look and see the improve, for example, in glucose. Yes, it was significant, but can we achieve it with a diabetic medication and use lower dose of this drug that's more expensive? However, what are we doing with the Cushing symptoms per se, including the quality of life depression that a diabetes medication is not going to improve? So we need more longer data to look at that. How about levocidoconazole? So the phase three prospective studies was done in several countries, a lot of them in Europe. And this was published earlier last year, a little bit before the other uh, paper. And the UFC normalization at six months with imputation was 42%. And I'm using with imputation just so you can compare with all the data that I've shown you earlier. Showed improvement in cardiovascular markers. Testosterone decreases in women and acne improved. So that was good. But I'm going to show you the data. Significant from graphs, but is it significant from clinical point of view? For some patients might be. The liver enzyme elevation was seen in 31% of patients and 11% and patients had elevations more than three times upper limit of normal, a little bit better than ketoconazole, but still significant. The good part was that was a reversible after discontinuing the drug. So I have here on the left how severe the Cushing's was. So look at the patients, most of them are Cushing's disease. The baseline mean UFC was over, uh, five times upper limit of normal. So severe patients. And this is where I said earlier, these were patients that were completely treatment naive. They didn't even have surgery in almost 30% of patients. So if you're looking at clinical features, I'm not showing you the cardiovascular markers because they were statistically significant, though that I don't know if we can say that from clinical point of view, they are significant. The acne improves though, and the patients are looking at that, the testosterone, and the Hirsutis total score in women decreased. Uh, so overall, the same feature for pushing quality of life and depression score. So we see some changes, but we have to decide how relevant they are overall. How about the glucocorticoid receptor blocker that's approved in US for hyperglycemia? associated with Cushing's. It's not approved in Europe and in other countries as far as I'm aware, but it's used off label. So the doses varied. We saw improvement in glucose. That's why it was approved for that, but also clinical signs and symptoms. However, you can measure cortisol. Um, a lot of patients had adrenal insufficiency, does not control the tumor volume, and the thyroid function uh, needs close monitoring, both for primary and for central hypothyroidism. We recently shown that. However, if you look at the diabetes, look, this is A1C, baseline, week 16 and week 24. This improvement was despite even decrease in uh, medications for diabetes. And then what I said earlier, clinical improvement. 
So we looked in this study at weight changes, diastolic blood pressure to our OGTT and Cushing's appearance. In red is much improved, blue is no change. So some patients improve significantly, some patients no change from diastolic blood pressure to OGTT that are more objective and could show the appearance and how they felt and what they were telling us. So not everybody is going to improve. So when we use a drug, we should know why we're using it. The way that was really, this is the graph on weight, it's percentage change, but if you're looking, this was about, they started at around 100 kilos. So it's also a uh, very significant decrease in weight. And what was important was that the decrease in waist circumference was also very good for patients that I showed you that the waist circumference per se was correlated with a lot of the complications. Uh, that depends also, that doesn't mean that because we want decrease in waist circumference, I'm going to start this drug that uh, cost over half a million uh, per year, for example, but we need to, to know which drug is doing what. So in summary, complications should be addressed and screened for immediately after diagnosis. After treatment for Cushing's disease, the cardiovascular risk factors and manifestations persist at various rates. So we should know and tell the patients. And I usually tell them that you have to be followed forever. The risk of recurrence is 30%. You might have even more complications that you didn't have before. And I usually uh, mention the heart attack and the uh, thromboembolic events. Uh, active Cushing's disease has even more adverse effects impact on survival and mortality after remission, as I showed you, it's affected by various confounding factors. So some studies show that we are almost back to normal. And probably these were the single center studies that are using aggressive <laughs> management of diabetes, cardiovascular disease and hypercoagulability. And the minimizing duration and extent of exposure to high cortisol by early diagnosis and rapid effective therapeutic intervention and systematic monitoring with tight control of all the risk factors I showed you earlier and put them in balance with the uh, pros of using additional treatment. I didn't show you data for bilateral adrenectomy or radiation to cure the patient earlier or everything as a multimodal treatment to get back to normal, but looking at the complications in the same time. So each patient is different and require different set of treatment. So overall, you have on the left patients with persistent disease after surgery stratified by individual clinical attributes uh, from a paper from Monica Gadella looking at predictive factors overall. This applies to acromegaly, this applies to Cushing's, I slightly adapted uh, for Cushing. So we have to look at comorbidities in parallel with biomarkers and disease characteristics to try to find the right treatment for the right patient. Thank you so much. And you have on the left, my clinic at Mount Hood and the hospital is up, so we'll take the train to go to the hospital. And on the right, my uh, hometown uh, city in Romania, Sibiu, I'm from Transylvania. Uh, so I guess I'm a vampire. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to meeting you one day.